All right, so when we look at different types of metrics that we can have, uh, we can track and measure results. Um, it's the most difficult or challenging part of marketing as a whole, of really being able to identify was this successful or not, especially if we're looking at if from an advertising perspective, it becomes really difficult. Um, yesterday, uh, as we were recording this for the people who are seeing this on video, uh, campus was closed. We had probably about seven or eight inches of snow. I haven't seen what the actual results were, um, but I guarantee you most of the retail businesses in the area had very low sales yesterday. And so if you're going to look at your marketing efforts and say, wow, you know, sales are down, there's reasons outside of our marketing efforts that sales could be down. There's reasons outside of our marketing efforts of why sales could be up. Uh, and so ultimately, when we look at how to track this, you know, the number one thing that's always used is what is our return on investment? Can we effectively track how many customers are coming in because of the activities that we are doing? The less money we have to spend on that. A lot of us are going to end up working for smaller and mid-sized businesses. The thing that follows those businesses is they don't have a lot of money to put into advertising. The advertising that and the marketing efforts that we use has to be efficient and effective forms of marketing that need to be cost effective and that they meet our specific target markets, right? And so in that, those module assignments, when you tried to lay out who your audience was, a lot of you, I said, hey, we want more depth and detail. The more detail I get with who our customer is, the more effective I can plan my marketing to those customers, right? Um, again, at the time of this recording, recently we just had a Super Bowl, $7 million to place an ad at the Super Bowl. How do you... How much product do you need to sell? How many movie tickets do you need to sell to be able to justify those errands? All right, when we look at web, website metrics, now I will say that digital marketing allows for a better tie-in to targeting and understanding and measuring did your advertising work uh, historically companies have used coupons the reason why we use coupons is because we can count at the end of the day how many coupons got turned in uh, for website obviously uh, we talk about the ethics of it but you're tracked every time you log on right there is somebody somewhere in an office right now who can pull up your IP address and say, oh, this is what they're doing, right? Because you're paying a company for internet services and they can see what sites you're on. They can see all that information, right? And then you have cookies that can track you where you are visiting, all right? And so when we talk about our website, we can have some interesting metrics or identifiers built in with our website. Number one, we can track new visitors to our site. And so the website will say, okay, this IP address, this we've had people here from this IP address before, this is a returning user. Oh, this is a new IP address. They haven't come from this site before. This is a new visitor. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We can see how many pages on our site that you have gone to. And so um, we can actually also see, uh, when we talk about bounce rate, we can also see 
how long visitors spend on your site before they leave. We can also see here, let's track their progression throughout the site. They get to a landing page, they get to our home page, they link on a product item. Do they follow this process through to make a purchase? Is there something wrong with our site where they don't necessarily make a purchase, All right? And so there's certain things in websites that can create what I call a stop sign that we will make the process as easy as possible. Are we providing a way for you to get through that process of continuing on and whatever our goal might be uh, in terms of making a purchase. Uh, we can identify traffic sources. Where are visitors coming from when it comes to our site? Are they coming? Are, how, how effective are our inbound links? Other sites that are linking to your content. When we talk about traffic sources, are you getting here from a search engine? Are you typing that directly into your search bar? Um, am I putting in the search engine like Gateway Tunnel College or am I putting in associate degree in entrepreneurship? And how are people getting to your site and getting into your content? Uh, and that falls into the keywords. Keywords, um, what keywords are being used most to get into your site and what is your conversion rate? And so when we talk about conversion rate, I get to your site, did I meet an expected goal? For most companies, the conversion rates are based off of, you got to the site, you made a purchase, all right? Where the break falls in like under conversion rate is what if our goal is for you to come to our brick and mortar store? That because that's where then that becomes a difficult thing to identify or understand. Now our conversion rate not, may not be for them to make a purchase. Maybe it's to download some content that we've created. We talk about customer met, uh, metrics. Uh, what's the life cycle? How long does it take to convert a prospect to a customer inside your sales funnel? Um, we briefly talk about sales funnels in the sales class. Um, but how much time and effort are we spending to bring a customer in? Now, generally speaking, the more expensive the products we sell, the longer it takes for them to... Uh, become a customer. What is the conversion rate? The percentage of people who perform a specialized or specific action, as we discussed earlier. Uh, what is the average lifetime customer value? How much, um, how much your average customer is worth in terms of revenue over their lifetime with us? And so, if we indeed meet that goal of making this a lifetime customer, I, I talk about this in sales all the time. Our goal isn't necessary to sell a product, right? Our goal is to provide you with great customer service that you buy products from us from an extended period of time. I can sell any product to anybody one time. That's easy. The challenge is, can I sell a chain of different products to that same customer because of the interaction they had with us for the one product? All right, in sales class, I use the example of when I sold computers. I worked for a brick and mortar store. It was a nationwide chain that sold computers. And we could go online and we had negotiation. Uh, I could negotiate price to a certain extent on hardware, but uh, the lower I 
the more I lowered my price, the less money I made on the sale. So I really didn't like to do that. I could go online and see, or in our internal database and see that the hardware items, meaning the computer, the laptops, those type of pieces, I would lose money on, or the store, I wouldn't, but the store would. And so there's some of the items that were going for two to $500 less than what we bought from the manufacturer. Why was that? Well, technology, uh, especially at that time, was so, was moving so fast. By the time it got to us, new technology was coming out. And so it was almost like by the time it got to the store, it was almost out of date at that point in time. And so we were seeing a lot of fluctuation of pricing. But at the end of the day, you came to us to buy a computer, but that's not what I was selling you. What I was selling you is for us to become your lifetime supplier of computer supplies and equipment, all right? I could sell you a printer and make a couple bucks on selling a printer. Where I made my money was selling you ink or selling you the cable that you needed, all right? Ever wonder why, like when you buy a printer, like the cable's not included? Well, because the cable's got a 3,000% markup on it. And so they want to give the stores the opportunity to make that profit. Paper, same thing, huge markup on paper, huge markup on software. Now, how has the industry changed? We are taking the store level piece out of the software equation. And think about your texts, right? Textbooks of all the classes that you take, how many of your textbooks are now digitally coded versus a actual physical book? I'm old school. I like the book, right? I like a physical textbook. It's almost impossible for me to like do assignments and curriculum and get classes set up without having that book next to me, right? Uh, my solution now is to go multiple monitor, but why do we not sell you the physical book anymore? Well, because it's more profitable to sell you a code for less money than we sell you the book because it has eliminated the secondary market for used books. There's no longer market for used books because everything has a code. And so the textbook manufacturers looked at that, oh, hey, this is a way that we could get rid of the used book market and actually make more money. Software, they really started running an issue of what? people stealing the product. And so they have moved into that cloud-based subscription plan instead of worrying about their product being pirated, All right? Um, and so how we sell our products has changed. And so the whole idea of the lifetime customer value has changed as well. Right, and so, um, great example, QuickBooks. Uh, you've taken probably accounting class or two or will uh, before your time is done here at Gateway and you have seen QuickBooks. What has really changed in terms of needs of a bookkeeping software? The needs of a bookkeeper pretty much has stayed the same for probably about the last 150 years. Sure, there's tax codes and stuff that change in there, but credits, debits, right? All pretty much been the same. If you want to have QuickBooks Online and you're a small business owner, you want QuickBooks Online and you want to do payroll for QuickBooks, it's going to cost you, I think it's $85 a month. Used to buy one package for four or five hundred dollars. Use it for until they stop supporting it, which you could probably get four or five years out of it. Well, now they're charging you almost eight hundred dollars a month, uh, eight hundred dollars a year for that piece, right? And so the lifetime customer value for their customer 
has gone up significantly with the change in how they offer and price that product. And so that goes into it, how much you charge, how long we think that customer is going to be a customer of ours. Um, automobile, new vehicles, houses, these are things that we hopefully don't buy a ton of in our lifetime. All right. Um, I think the average person might buy three houses in their lifetime. Um, a car, depending on how much you drive it, seven to 10 years if you buy one new, uh, maybe longer than that. Um, and so that lifetime customer value is changed by, again, the frequency of how often I purchase that product. Metric on customer satisfaction. On satisfaction, what are the ratings customers give for how satisfied they are with your service? Now we can do that through, oh, what a, there's a bunch of different, you know, there's different places you can put reviews online. Um, you can put a review on Google, you can put a review on Yelp. Um, there's a bunch of different places to re do reviews. You can do annual customer satisfaction surveys like we do here at Gateway, where we send out a survey regular to our customers for them to identify their satisfaction or lack thereof on a wide variety of different topics. Uh, we can do metrics on emails we send out, how many people open our emails, uh, and then how many people click on a link inside the email. And so we can try to track effectiveness that way. And then if, you know, this is one of those things of, well, if we're not read, reading that, reaching that benchmark that we wanted to on the email, we're not getting enough people clicking inside the email. Well, then maybe we need to change what the body of that message looks like. Uh, what's, again, conversion rate? How many people, once they clicked in the email, got to our website, ended up purchasing something from us? Uh, how many people unsubscribed to our list? Um, and how many current and new subscribers that you have. Now you can, when it comes to email and how you send it out, there's two different ways that you can do it. You can do what we call opt in, or we can do what is called opt out. I've set up loyalty programs for an establishment and we decided to build a opt in component to their loyalty program. And so we'd have them fill out a card. We would mail them a little like scan card, you know, like we have and all these different things. And now we don't even use those anymore. We just ask you for your phone number. But on that application, we said, would you like to receive emails about promotions? Yes or no. And so then once they clicked yes, we would enter their email into our email system and they would get emails. Now you can do the opt out piece, which is you automatically send everybody an email unless they hit the unsubscribe button. From a marketing ethics piece, I always believe in the opt in side of that world versus the opt out side. There's a lot of different, different opinions on that. That is my opinion uh, with the clients and the customers that I work with just because we don't want to, and I don't want to inundate people with email unless they want our email. Uh, because it could be a situation where, you know, a customer gets frustrated with what we send them and instead of unsubscribing from the list, they, uns they unsubscribe us from their life. They no longer want to be customers of ours. All right, social metrics, social media type of stuff here. Uh, it's going to obviously these terms change per site. Um, 
How many people like a post? How many people like your business on Facebook? <clears throat> How many people have shared the post? What type of engagement are you getting? Uh, and I've said this before in this class, Facebook gets less engagement than a lot of the other social media networks, but they have more people on those on in their social network than anybody else. Uh, obviously, we, retweets is a, that's a Twitter uh, term. How many followers do you have? Like those are the things that you can look at in terms of how successful or unsuccessful that post may or may not have been. Advertising metrics, when we talk about digital metrics, we can look at something we call cost per click or CPC. And this is the cost each time someone clicks on your ad. And so the nice thing about cost per click versus cost per impression, right? Right below that, you see cost per, cost per impression. And um, they list CPM. And that means cost per thousand. Uh, if we ever get to Super Bowl M, that means we've had a thousand Super Bowls. Uh, so it's just the Len terminology that's being thrown in there. Cost per impression just means some that that ad showed up. Um, I worked for a company where we had a publication and a website, and we charged on cost per impression. And so every time that ad showed up, your little banner ad showed up on top, that counted as one of those cost per impressions, and that's how we build you. All right. Now, mind you, granted, this is like short, small potato stuff I'm talking about, but it shows you unethical activity as well. So at that place, I mean, we probably had 20 or 25 employees. Everyone had to put the association page as their homepage on their browser, on their computer, at their desk. Because every time we opened up a browser window, that would show up and that would count as a CPM or a cost per impression. And so it didn't track and say, oh, we've already had this IP address identified as someone who saw this ad. It would just run it through. One day I walk in my boss's office, I'm like, and he's just looking away at his mouse. I'm like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, it's end of the month. I got to get the impressions up so we can bill our clients. And he's just hitting a refresh on his button on his laptop to get the ads to cycle through so he can get a higher cost per impression. I'm like, oh, I guess that's an answer. Uh, and so cost per impression is just, boom, someone sees that ad. Doesn't mean that they want to see the ad. Doesn't mean they like your product just that that ad is popping up, boom, it's been seen. Now you can do it where uh, we're negotiating with the Journal Times for some advertising. And part of this bundle they wanted to sell us was we got 10,000 impressions a month. Once we would hit 10,000 impressions, they would pull our ad off. And so you can limit the number of impressions that you're gonna bill for. The nice thing about that is you can then also have a more defined budget versus I'm saying, oh, we had 125 impressions and you budgeted for 10,000 impressions that month. That at least allows that ad to get cut off at a certain point. Cost per click, generally speaking, is gonna be more expensive than cost per impression. Cost per click is saying, okay, um, let's say you're doing SEO, search engine optimization, you want, you want, uh, every time I put entrepreneurship education in, I want Gateway to come up on that search engine. Cost per click says, I'm going to get billed every time someone clicks my link that shows up. The benefit to cost per click is, it's not just saying that someone saw the ad. What it's saying is someone saw the ad, it drew interest from them and they wanted to find out more information. And so then they, clicked into your site. Now from there, we can go into that bottom item of cost per action because now once you do that, 
I can follow you through the process. Now you've entered my website. I know where you came from. How long did you spend on my website? Did you take the action that we wanted you to? Which could be making a purchase. It could be getting content. Whatever action we wanted you to take, download a coupon, whatever it was, now we can track you through that process. And so you can be paid on cost per action. That's more specialized. Um, Google's not going to do a cost per action type of activity. Generally speaking, your product probably has to be a little bit on the higher expensive side for the cost per action piece to come into play. Google Analytics. Um, you get code to put in your site and you can, I get emails from Google and say, oh, let's look at the analytics for your site this month. And it will tell you, this is how many impressions you've had. This is how many people have gone to your site. This is where the IPs come from. Um, you can get analytics from a lot of different things. Um, I have a YouTube channel. Um, before we started using some technology where I don't have to post my videos on YouTube anymore. Um, but I had a YouTube channel or still do, and I can see where and when people are viewing my videos. Um, we used to use a simulation here at school that was awful. Um, and so I made these videos to help students to use the simulation better. And I still get people viewing these videos. And I'm telling you, they're like 12 years old at this point in time. And some schools are still using the same simulation and people can put their feedback on there. I can see how many people view it. I can see people who will go on and like, thanks for the video, it makes it a lot easier. I wish my teacher would have posted something like this, blah, 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 blah. So I can see those content pieces. Uh, I have some marketing research videos that uh, I get tons of views from India. I'm not sure why, um, but yeah. So if the gateway thing doesn't work out for me, I can always teach in India, I guess, because um, I'm big there in marketing research. When it comes to data and metrics, just like all the information I just gave you, there's tons of data and information out there. The technology, the computer in front of you, it allows us to have access to more and more information. We need to identify which data sets or data points are important when we're trying to look at the different marketing goals we're trying to achieve. Oh. 